Welcome to Improv for the Podcast. On this week's episode, we'll be exploring the history of whose line is it anyway? Let's hit it. Welcome to Improv for the Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Lee Evans. And on this week's episode, we're going to talk about the history of a very, very special television program, uh, both to myself and to many others out there, many folks who have been on this show. And uh, that show, of course, is Whose Line Is It Anyway? It's the show that many believe, myself included, brought improv into the mainstream American consciousness. I know this is a show uh, I started watching growing up. We didn't often have cable in my household, but with the antenna, uh, we were able to get ABC and sometimes ABC Family, if my memory is correct, and we were able to watch Who's Line. Um, so I know for me, it was a very accessible show that I love to watch at home. It was hilarious. I didn't even understand that it was made up initially when I saw it. And then as I got older uh, into middle school, oh boy, did I figure out, I was like, wait, they're making this up on the spot? I was a theater kid and and used to scripts and lines and things like that. And seeing these guys week after week come on stage and just off the top of their head, off the dome, make it up was incredible. It was hilarious. They were all so talented. Um, It was amazing to see. Um, So with that, uh, with that preface, uh, right, of my love for Who's Line, right, uh, it's uh, one of the ways I was introduced to improv in my younger years, both through uh, doing various theater things, but also watching the show, uh, I wanted to take some time to kind of talk about the history of the show, just like a brief overview. You know, there are obviously more in-depth ways uh, to learn about Whose Line. Uh, we've had uh, folks on this show who have been on Whose Line is it anyway, when we had Jonathan Mangum on um, a few episodes back. He's been on Whose Line many times. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, just Whose Line. It's kind of ingrained in... A lot of what we do here at IFTP, it's it's been an influence on us both directly and indirectly. So I thought, why not spend some time d- digging into the show, learning about its origins, right? We've done this with long form improv and some other things before, but I wanted to do this with, yeah, the show that brought improv to the mainstream American consciousness. So with that said, maybe you're listening and you're like, what is whose line is it anyway? They keep saying this, um, you know, not everyone knows who it is, and that is okay. Right? So let's put it like this. Uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? It's a popular improvisational comedy television show that originated in the United Kingdom before kind of rebooting, retooling in the United States. Um, The show features a cast of comedians playing various short form improvisational games um, where the points don't matter. And oftentimes the episodes will feature a celebrity guest or improviser. The show ran for 10 seasons in the UK version. Um, from 1988 to 1999, and then 20 total seasons in the U.S., spanning 1998 to um, technically early 2024. And the show isn't over, but it may not be coming back in the same way. It's kind of unclear right now, and we'll talk about that a little more at the end. So, Whose Line? Where did this come from? How did it get started? So the original Whose Line Is It Anyway show actually takes us all the way back to 1988. And it was created by this guy named Dan Patterson and Mark Levinson. It actually began as a radio show um, led by comedians Stephen Fry and John Sessions. They just had the idea to take uh, short form improv games, put them on the radio, kind of preface it, and immediately it was already pretty popular. And it didn't take long. In fact, later that year in 1988, It actually went from radio to television and quickly became a success in the UK, which is pretty wild. You know, just this idea like, hey, uh, this improv thing, let's take these two guys, we'll throw it on the radio, see how it does. Less than a year, it moved to television and the BBC started airing it and it it, it became a hit. The show was highly successful during its 10 year run. I mean, it experienced uh, different ups and downs, of course, due to performers, you know, sometimes it was burnout, they were losing interest or... Uh, a performer had to leave the show for personal reasons, or perhaps they were let go. There's just, uh, you know, a lot of things that happen over the time. And, uh, you know, comedians uh, can be great to work with, but also, you know, sometimes with celebrity comes volatility, right? So the show started off strong. It had its high notes, its low notes over those 10 years. But kind of the main overall theme was that this show slowly started becoming more American as it continued to air. Uh, Midway through its run, 
uh, Ryan Stiles and Colin Mockery were brought in to kind of bolster the cast, you know, bring some extra improv talent in. And uh, it didn't take long for them to become stars because folks just saw how phenomenal they were at improv. And their skills resonated with UK audiences, even though you know, they were being brought over from the US. And there were a number of other US comedians that became involved as well. And over time, more US comedians trickled into the cast and UK comedians trickled out. So near the end of the show, uh, in that 10-year run, it was rare that you would actually see a British comedian still on there. And some of the last episodes of the show, they actually shot in the US rather than in the UK, just as things faded over time. Um, and that's part of what led to the show's downfall in the UK, is that it kind of lost its roots, right? Someone from the UK can watch an American improviser and enjoy it, appreciate their performance, laugh, find it funny, but it's the cultural nuance that you lose, right? Uh, improvisers or comedians raised in the United States, raised in American culture, are going to have a different sense of humor, different references than comedians who are raised in the UK. That's just the truth of the matter, and that's kind of what led to the UK version you know, losing its audience, kind of losing the soul that it once started out with. But at the end of the day, while the British show did come to an end, uh, it, it, it led to the opportunity for an American version to be born. And um, at the end of the show, it had, uh, at, at the end of the UK version of Whose Line, we kind of saw the seeds, the beginnings of the American version with them shooting in America, Ryan Stiles, Colin Mockery, even Wayne Brady had made an appearance on the UK version. And this led to the American adaptation in 1998. So how did this happen? So uh, Drew Carey, he had been, you know, the host of the American sitcom, The Drew Carey Show, and he was a fan of the British version. And so he worked with Dan Patterson, one of the original creators, to help adapt the show for American audiences. And not long after the British show ended, right, the American version debuted in 1998. Drew Carey served as the host, which, uh, you know, it, it was a pretty similar format to the British version with improvisational games and sketches. But a big difference was that Drew Carey presented things as if it were a game show, right? He'd always introduce the show, well, no, whose line is it anyway? I'm Drew Carey, where, you know, the, the rules are made up and the points don't matter. And that was always something he said. But in his version of the show, there would be a prize at the end of it, right? And oftentimes the prize was whoever he decided got the most points in the episode, that person would get to host the final game uh, for the show, and then Drew Carey would go ahead and participate in uh, the improv scenes. And some of those early cast members, of course, included Ryan Stiles, Colin Mockery, Wayne Brady, and then they'd usually leave that fourth spot open for guest performers. So uh, Drew Carey, right? We know what he did in the past. Uh, he was the host of the Drew Carey show. Yeah, and he, again, partnered with Dan Patterson to bring this television show to life, uh, to kind of pull it all together and say, hey, I love this version that you have. Let's kind of retool it, reformat it for American audiences. And as we mentioned before, right, the, the format was pretty simu similar. Um, so some of the games or kind of how the structure of the show worked is that oftentimes the performers would be acting out scenes, creating characters, or singing songs based on suggestions from the host, uh, prompts from the audience, or pre-written cue cards, right? Scenes from a hat was a classic game. And the lack of scripts for the show meant that performers had to rely on their quick thinking, right? They had to improvise and use their comedic wit to keep things entertaining. Um, it's the production schedule for the show is crazy. I, I read an interview with Colin Mockery, just to kind of get more behind-the-scenes looks, and oftentimes, you know, they would shoot for four days, but you're doing four days of shooting improv, just tons of scenes and games, and, you know, back to back to back. The audience is probably like, ooh, tired out from all of this. But they were sometimes able to pull, like, 20 episodes worth of content out of four days of shooting. It's crazy. I mean, the episodes were, you know, 22 minutes in its standard format with the eight minutes for commercials there for uh, American broadcast television. But just absolutely insane. You'd, you'd come in as an improviser and be like, all right, I'm going to be doing improv all day. I'm going to be playing all these different games. The, the hoedown, you know, the Irish drinking song, and uh, scenes from a hat, um, you know, things y you can say to, you know, your friend, but not your girlfriend, right? All those different creative games they came up with. Just absolute madness and insanity. Um, it's an incredible show and just really brought short-form improv uh, to the general American household. Uh, 
So the show, you know, in addition to the core cast members that we mentioned before, uh, featured guest appearances, right? Comedians, actors, celebrities, musicians even in the later reboot seasons. Um, The guest stars would join in the improvisational games and, you know, they'd kind of add their own flair. Um, The show would also feature themed episodes or special events such as holiday themed shows or episodes filmed on location. Um, Some of the notable celebrity guests over the years include Robin Williams, Sid Caesar, Whoopi Goldberg, right? And that's just to name a few. Uh, especially in the rebooted version, which we'll get to in a little later. They had a lot, pretty much celebrity guests, I think, on, on most episodes, including like athletes and different things like that. They really kind of opened up the format and explored that a lot more. So the show was popular, you know, uh, during its early years. You know, Ryan Stiles, Colin Mockery, Absolute Powerhouses, Wayne Brady, a young flame sparking passion for improv uh, all across the United States. But believe it or not... Um, in 2003, the show was canceled due to low ratings, which led to the comedians moving on to other creative pursuits, including game shows, movies, touring, and more, right? Um, 2003, so early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of time for everyone to kind of go and explore and discover other things. But what was actually crazy, and I never realized, is that the show was canceled in 2003, but it still aired until 2007 because of reruns, and then they were able to produce two years worth of new episodes just based off unaired footage. They had that much content from these improvisers. They were able to pull out two seasons, two years worth of episodes. That's that's crazy. So the show actually stopped airing in 2007. It was canceled in 03, stopped airing in 07. They had an initial four years of time to continue airing the show. And during all this, you know, uh, all the improvisers, comedians, they were all, some of them were pursuing their own solo projects. Some of them were collaborating, working on different television shows and things like that. Um, It's really interesting to kind of get into all the different paths that uh, these comedians branched off to during that time. But uh, that is not the aim of today's episode. But fascinating. And I suggest you take a look. A lot of shows you may have heard of are like, might spark a memory, uh depending on how old you were during like the early to mid 2000s, you might be like, oh my gosh, I remember seeing commercials for that on television or, oh, I remember watching that. Whatever happened to that show? So all in all, during this hiatus, um, the hiatus in total was about 10 years. I mean, they didn't know it was a hiatus at the time, but the opportunity to bring the show back arose. And um, in 2013, CW decided to bring it back. You know, they reached out to the actors and everyone, and they said, hey, we want to bring back Who's Line. The biggest difference, however, is that the host change, Drew Carey, uh, was off busy doing other projects, game shows, and things like that. Uh, so CW decided to cast Aisha Tyler um, as the new host of Who's Line. Is it anyway? And if you don't know Aisha Tyler, uh, one show um, she's pretty well known for is the animated television series Archer, where she plays... Uh, Agent Lana, I believe that's her character's name. I haven't seen it in a while, but I think I think that was her character's name. Uh, anyway, so Aisha Tyler was a new host, and her style, different than Drew Carey's, but she still had a great rapport with the cast and often interjected with her own quips. Uh, she didn't usually participate in the games themselves, though. So, you know, the original big three came back, Ryan Styles, Colin Mockery, Wayne Brady. But this time, uh, the guest performers included, like, athletes and celebrities, musicians. They really broadened their horizons. And again, this was in 2013. So the show has gone on to air essentially for an additional 10 years uh, since they brought it back, you know, bringing us to now uh, at the time of recording, early 2024. Um, this is pretty amazing. I mean, the improvisers... You know, they, they got to have such a passion for this. The amount of time they've spent working together, uh, working with those guests, uh, I I can't even imagine. And I think uh, they they all have to love it so much. Love improv more than anyone uh, to have done as much as they have while shooting this show. Um, so as I mentioned at the time of recording, the future of the show right now is unknown. But in the interview that I've referenced before with Colin Mockery, um, the current cast, the current iteration, crew, all that, they've they've kind of all decided to move on. They've seen it as they've taped their last episode. Um, and it, they're deciding to go on and do other things. You know, it's probably, it's time. There's, for some of those guys, Colin and Ryan, they've been loosely involved in Who's Line for the past 30 years. And they're ready to try something new. Um, But that doesn't mean CW may not continue the show. They might get different actors, comedians. Who knows what that looks like? But it's not going to be the same show that we've fallen in love with with, um, as it's aired. So 
Whose line? Um, kind of some reflections, and I think one of the biggest points, one of the biggest purposes, I think it's interesting to look at the history. Again, this is just a brief glance over of Whose Line and kind of its incredible run uh, between British and U.S. television. So I want to pull this excerpt uh, from an interview that Colin Mockery did uh, with Vulture.com, uh, kind of reflecting on the past 30 years of Whose Line and what how it's helped lead to improv's growth, particularly in the United States. And he says this, um, just the fact that it's in the public consciousness, and that, I think, is all due to Whose Line once it became popular. Kids really seem to be drawn to it, so there were improv clubs starting in college and high school, and then, like any other kind of art form, people just kind of played around with it to see what sort of formats could be done. Everything from an improvised one-act play to improvised Dungeons and Dragons. I think the surface is still kind of just being scratched. I've been very fortunate for the success of Who's Line that I've been able to tour all around the world and work with improvisers from all around the world. I always say the guys on Who's Line are pretty good, but there are fantastic improvisers all around the world who just haven't had a series showcase them, and they're constantly finding ways to play with the format and do different things. I think Colin makes some really, truly incredible points here, right? Improv was a beautiful art form before Who's Line, right? We've talked about uh, kind of the brief history We've talked about Viola Spolin on this show before and kind of seeing improv's growth, its early roots in education and leading to the booming uh, improv scene in Chicago, New York, Toronto, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and all these different places. That's just in North America, not including the rest of the world. Uh, But whose line helped it become more mainstream? I bet if you were to ask folks, you know, in maybe the early 90s, if they weren't in one of the major cities, Uh, where improv was commonplace, they might not be familiar with the art form. But after Whose Line started airing, I think that all changed. I know it brought improv to me. I didn't live in one of those big improv cities. I didn't live in a small city, but, you know, I wasn't in the improv capital of the world. And it introduced and kind of gave improv a spotlight to say, like, hey, this art form is possible. You can get up on stage and make things up. And it is funny. And it is good. And it is enjoyable. And... Although these guys are are specialists, some of the best, anyone can do it. And I think it's so important for for art to be accessible. And a show like Whose Line that aired on broadcast television that didn't require cable, just an antenna, uh, was a great way to introduce people to an art form they might have never known about. Right? I think that's that's what makes art good is when it's accessible to all art for the people. Uh, improv for the people. Whoa. <laughs> Listen to that, right? Making something accessible to anyone who wants to try it rather than a select few, rather than being exclusive. So that's what I think some of the importance, the impact of Who's Line, right? It's brought improv into the American zeitgeist consciousness. Um, people know what it is because of the show. They have a loose familiarity with it. Um, that they might not have had otherwise. You know, you can invite someone into an improv show and they might have s- some kind of idea. They're like, oh yeah, that's the thing where you're going to make it all up, right? They know that. But that might have been different 30, 35 years ago. Thank you, Who's Line. So overall, Who's Line is it anyway? Has made a mark on the world of comedy. It's showcasing the talent of the performance and entertaining so many audiences over the years with spontaneity, wit, and humor. Um, and as you've heard in this podcast, it introduced myself and many, many of its guests to improv as an art form. And we know that whatever the future holds for the show, um, whether that's a new cast or the show ends altogether, uh, we'll always have these amazing 20 seasons, plus the British version of the show to look back on, reflect, reminisce, and be thankful for. Um, so just a little bit about Whose Line Is It Anyway, an incredible show. If you've never seen it before, if you've somehow escaped it, Uh, I highly encourage you to go back. You can go on YouTube. I think they post like best of clips. Uh, Find it streaming somewhere. Find it on TV. I don't know. Uh, It's out there. Go back and watch it. It's it's a great show. I guarantee you'll laugh. There's so many games and so many iconic moments. So many great one-liners that have come from that show that just are incredible works of improv. And I think it'll really give you an appreciation for, for short form and how well it can be played. And hope you think about the possibilities and what more can be done with improv because like Colin said there's so much good improv happening out there that we don't see showcased on television kind of I don't know that kind of inspires me it's like wow this guy who's considered one of the best improvisers ever of all time one of the most famous improvisers 
thinks there's even greater stuff out there happening in the world that's not happening on his own show. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to the special version of Improv for the Podcast, where we talked about whose line, its kind of important significance, a little bit of history as well. Um, as always, uh, you can find Improv for the Podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. Seriously, I, I think it's on like Amazon, Stitcher, probably weird websites you've never even heard of. Uh, we're there. Um, as always, we'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, we'll see you next time. Improv for the podcast was created by Matt Moore and Michael Lee Evans. Edited and produced by Michael Lee Evans. And finally, presented by Improv for the People. Interested in more IFTP? You can visit us at improvforthepeople.com or on our socials, such as Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, new episodes are released weekly. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.